we'll start with a review from last week. Father, uh, thanks for um, your word and the opportunity to think about it together. We pray that you would use this time to uh, increase our understanding and appreciation of Scripture. And uh, Lord, more than that, uh, in addition to that, uh, encourage us. Uh, Lord, use your word to shape us, um, to renew our minds, that we might honor you with our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. All right. Well, um, last week we introduced this class on Genesis, and uh, one of the things that uh, I said then was, uh, rather than like serving just the content of Genesis, what we want to do is, is kind of think bigger picture in terms of how do we read Genesis, how do we understand what Genesis is all about, and um, one of the major premises is that we need to understand it on its own terms. We started off last week and we talked about how... Um, if you guys are just coming in, there are handouts on the chair there if you didn't see them. We talked about how a lot of times, especially with Genesis 1, but with any of these uh, books in the Bible, we have a tendency to kind of come to them with our own questions. And that's a legitimate thing to do, right? If you have a question about some topic, you want to see if the Word of God has something to say about it and, and be informed by that. So it's a completely legitimate thing to do, but a lot of times, especially with Genesis 1, we'll bring questions that we have, legitimate questions to the text, um, and we're reading it kind of from our grid, rather than kind of stepping back and trying to understand it on its own terms. Um, and whatever the scriptures speak to, it speaks to truthfully, um, but we want to try to understand, you know, what, what the text is actually saying, what the author intended, and we use this approach where we think about the author writing to a specific audience, and, you know, so author, text, and audience. The, you know, uh, we do this instinctively or intentionally in the New Testament. Uh, I said, you know, I think I used the example of Paul writing to the Galatians. You know, we, when we get ready to study Galatians, we want to think about, okay, who wrote it? The Apostle Paul, what do we know about him? When did he write it? Who did he write it to? What was going on in Galatia? Can we, can we understand the context of the first century, maybe correlate it with the book of Acts and what was going on there. And that context informs how we understand the text. And I'm suggesting that we do the same thing with the Old Testament as well. Um, and so we don't necessarily always read Genesis this way. I think a lot of times we read it, um, you know, just in terms of what the story is, which is, you know, great. That's, that's a good thing. You know, we're learning about Abraham, we're learning about creation, we're learning about Joseph. But what I'd like to suggest to you, there's handouts there in the back if you didn't get them when you came in. Uh, what I'd like to suggest to you is that um, we should understand as we approach Genesis, same way we do with the New Testament, we think Moses wrote Genesis. Who did he write it to? The Israelites who were coming out of the Exodus, mid-15th mid century BC, 1440-ish is kind of when we think the, uh, the Exodus was. And what was, what was their situation? How would Genesis minister to them? What did Moses want to communicate to them? He's not just writing just this random history, right? He's writing for a specific purpose. He's, he's shepherding them. He's leading them. And so we want to understand Moses' purpose. Um, and as we approach Genesis, not only do we want to start with that original meaning that, that Moses intended, as best we can understand that, but we want to see how these themes get traced through the scriptures. Genesis, in particular, sets trajectories for all kinds of themes, right, that run throughout the whole Bible. It is the, it's the opening chapter of this story that God is writing throughout redemptive history. Later, Revelation is going to add to that. It's going to give us more specifics. It's going to clarify things. Um, progressively, God is going to reveal his purposes and his will to his people, but those purposes are in direct continuity with the themes that get laid down. In Genesis. And then um, ultimately, those themes point to Christ. Uh, Jesus in Luke 24 uh, starts uh, both with the disciples on the Emmaus Road and also with his own disciples, you know, that are hiding. Uh, he, he begins with Moses and the law, you know, and the prophets and the writings, the Psalms. And he, and he explains to them how all the scriptures point to him. 
and his purpose. And so we're Christ-centered, and we want to read the Bible in a Christ-centered way. So what does Genesis have to do with Christ, and then how does it apply to us today? So that's the general approach that we want to take to the class. Uh, handouts are on the chair if you missed them when you came in. If anybody missed last week, I have a handout, some extra handouts from last week. Just let me know if you need it. Uh, it's here. And so what we did last week was we started with Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3. We didn't read the whole passage. We didn't have time to do that. We are familiar with it. Um, and uh, we began by looking at that original meaning, Moses' purpose. And we talked about how the chapter, the section is really broken down with an introduction where it's a summary of the whole thing God created in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. And then it introduces this dramatic tension in the text. Um, at the beginning of that process of creation, the earth was formless and void. Right? It, was, it was empty. It didn't have any structure to it. And then it's followed by six days of ordering, uh, where God separates uh, light from dark. Right? And waters below from the waters above. The first three days, he creates form. It was formless. Now there's four. In the, in the next three days, days four, five, and six, he takes each of those spheres, light and dark, and he creates inhabitants in them, right? Sun, moon, and stars uh, to light the day at evening, right? Uh, waters above, waters below, he creates fish and birds. Uh, separating the land from the water, he creates the land animals, culminating in Adam and Eve, creating in his image in day six. And so, and then, and then sat for us. Right, where he celebrates uh, and, and it's full of joy and worship and peace and shalom. And so through this process, we see God's sovereignty. Um, he speaks and it happens, right? the power of his word. Um, we see progress, right? this form and content that I just described. And there's a polemic to it as well. Um, Moses, in pretty subtle but clear, unmistakable ways to the original audience, Moses is undermining the deities, the pantheons of the ancient Near Eastern religions around him. These things that people worship, the sun, right? Um, uh, it's just a created light. It doesn't even have a name. It's just a light to, you know, a, a light to light the day. Um, he has power over all these things that other people worship, and they are just creatures that obey his word, right? And so... Um, <coughs> It's a, a beautiful thing. And then it ends with this, this epilogue um, of rest, suggesting being in the presence of God, God's people in his place, under his word, celebrating his presence. Right? This is God's intent and God's intent for Israel. Um, and so the big idea, I think, from Genesis 1 that Moses wants to communicate, there's lots of details, important details, but the big idea is that God is acting in creation. Uh, Moses is telling them about what God did in creation in order to explain to, to Israel what he wants to do for them in their day. Right? Uh, after the Exodus. In Deuteronomy, um, uh, he refers back to their time in the Exodus, or in Israel, uh, Egypt. Eyes and E's, too many eyes and E's. Uh, back to their time in Egypt when they're complaining they want to go back. And he says, um, it's translated uh, in, our, in our English translations, you know, that was that. How, Egypt was howling wasteland. But he's using the same terminology, tolu bohu, formless and void. Don't go back to Egypt, that land of chaos where you were a slave, right? I'm taking you to a promised land, a land that resembles Eden, right? Where you'll be in my presence as my people under my word. Uh, and so he's, he's shepherding them. And so they could trust him to bring order to the chaos of their lives. And the application for us, of course, is so we can too. And the disruption and the chaos that we're going through, analogous to what the uh, Israelites were experiencing in the Exodus and the turmoil and going to a place they've never seen before and all the uncertainty of the future and you know the dangers that they're going through and the unsettledness, God is with them and he's with us as well. And so... Um, we, we focused last week um, on the original meaning to Moses' audience. Uh, any thoughts or questions 
for those of you that were there last week or just hearing my kind of brief summary this morning about what we've covered so far. Okay, we'll jump in. Uh, today we're going to finish out that lesson summary. We're going to start by the biblical elaborations. How does the rest of the scripture take these themes that are introduced in creation and extend them? Right? How, how, where does the scripture elaborate on these ideas? And we can't talk about all of them. They're extensive. They're throughout the, the whole scriptures. But I want to set some trajectories for us. Um, and first, let's think about how scripture describes the promised land where God is going to take the Israelites after the Exodus, right? He's going to give them the promised land. Later, when they're in exile, uh, the prophets are going to refer back to the land of Israel in similar terms, right? So the promised land, whether it's that original audience or whether it's future prophets describing it, how does the scripture describe the promised land? And um, the first passage I'd have us look at is, is Deuteronomy 8, 7 to 10. Somebody read that for us. What are we calling? Thanks. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks, streams, and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and hills. A land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey. A land where bread will not be scarce, and you will lack nothing. A land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Okay, so what are some of the things that strike you from that description of the promised land? Just, what do you see there? Abundance. Abundance, good. Yeah. Much better life than what they had in Egypt. Yep, that's good. Yeah, better life. Anything else? Food. <laughs> food. Yeah, a lot of food. food. All right, compare that. Um, we're we're going to get to this in a couple of lessons. Uh, not next week, but probably the week after. Um, but you know about the fall, right? And uh, compare this description of the promised land with the description of Part of the part of the curse, right? The curse as it affects creation. So may read that. Jake. Cursed is the ground because of you, though painful toil through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. You will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you so compare these two descriptions, right? What, uh, what comes to mind as you think about what Moses is telling the Israelites about the world post-fall and what the promised land he's taking them is like? Um, this one seems like you have to work for you. What's um, that? You have to work for your food where God gave you the food. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. And, you know, obviously they'll work for it here as well, but... As we'll see, um, some of the descriptions uh, that the prophets in particular give is that it's it's an abundant provision, right? Yeah. So it, it you know it it feels like some of the effects of the curse are being rolled back. Um, the description of the promised land harkens back to conditions that reflect more the Garden of Eden than the curse: uh, thorns and thistles by the sweat of your brow. Uh, you'll scratch out a living kind of idea. God's salvation through the Exodus delivers them from bondage in e uh, Egypt and is going to deliver them into a promised land that begins to give them a picture, a glimpse of restoration, of recreation, of the world, the creation as it's intended to be. And we can trace this theme out more, but let's, let's go on for our purposes and look at some of the prophets. Isaiah 41 is writing about what the land will be like when they come back from exile. So Isaiah is writing in the 6th century BC. Uh, before they go into exile by, uh, by Babylon, 
but he's telling them about that exile and what will happen on the other end of it. And he says, I will make rivers flow on barren heights and springs within the valleys. I will turn the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into streams. It's just in this picture of what was barren and desolate is going to be made lush. Right? Um, thoughts or comments on that? Yeah, yeah, let's go, let's go there, yeah. So Amos, um, Amos is an interesting book because the entire book is judgment except for the last couple of verses. But, the, but it ends with this beautiful picture of restoration. And, and Amos uh, tells them, on the other end of exile, when you come back to the land, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills, and I will bring my people Israel back from exile. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wines. They will make gardens and eat their food. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I've given them, says the Lord your God. What strikes you from Amos's picture of restoration? This is dramatic imagery. I mean, think about those words, especially the, 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 you know, the first verse there. The reaper will be overtaken by the plowman. What's he saying? What, what, like, picture that reality. What is he describing? <coughs> the harvest is so super abundant, you can't even get it on hand before it's time to plant again. Right? It's like, we gotta, we gotta work hard to just like clear it out before it's time to plant again. It's just so productive, right? Um, the wine is just so, the vineyards are just so lush, right? It's as if wine is running down the hillsides. Uh, a land flowing with milk and honey. Like literally the udders of the cows are so full, it's just running down the hills. It's just leaking out, they can't, they can't contain it all. It's just super abundant provision, right? It's, it's, it's the opposite of the curse, right? Uh, it's this picture of God's salvation. And in verse 15, there's a, there's a sense of like permanence. Yeah. Stability. Yeah. Um, it was safe, stable. Exactly. Yeah, good, good. Um, so it's kind of eidetic. And, and we get similar, you know, similar pictures in Joel. Um, there's many of these in the prophets. It's just another one. In that day, the mountains will drip new wine and the hills flow with milk. All the ravines of Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and will water the valley of Acacia. It's right, just paradise. What do you think, Elizabeth? Um, the forest is just very pretty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's beautiful. It's glorious, right? These are all referring to post Babylon. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, um, but, but um, Moses describes the promised land in these similar terms back in right. Deuteronomy and yep. stuff, right? So this yep. is a description of the promised land regardless of when they're there. Um, but uh, we get these, these just kind of super abundant <laughs> pictures. Well, they're, they're true in Deuteronomy as well. Um, this is how the promised land is depicted. It's, it's a symbol, it's a picture, an analogy of, eat, of return, of restoration when we're in God's presence again in a land that is bountiful, like the garden was, right? Um, okay, so let's, let's think about the New Testament. Um, the New Testament characterizes this time of restoration from Israel at the pro restoration from exile that the prophets described for so many hundreds of years. It, it characterizes that, as, of that restoration as something that Jesus does, right? Jesus is described in the New Testament in terms that the prophets pointed forward to when they described what would happen when God restores his people Israel after the exile. Does that make sense? I don't know if I said that very clearly. Um, Jesus' fulfillment of uh, the restoration themes of the prophets, right? And Genesis 1, the New Testament authors, use as a prototype of what that salvation is all about. Jesus' ministry and what he accomplishes. Uh, it's interesting, we read passage, I, I, maybe I should speak for myself, I don't want to characterize y'all, 
But you know, we read passages like Romans 8, where it talks about how the creation is groaning, right? Longing for the redemption of the sons of God. And we kind of, I think a lot of times have a tendency to read that as, oh, you know, that's that's kind of interesting. I guess creation is going to get restored too. You know, you know, we're focused on our own kind of personal private experience of salvation that Jesus accomplished. But but this is really the thrust of the whole Old Testament, right? That God is going to remake the world. He's going to restore creation. He's going to roll back the curse, right? We sing in the Christmas carol, right? As far as the curse is found. He comes to make his blessings known as far as the curse is found, right? Creation will be remade. There'll be a new heavens and a new earth. And we as restored, redeemed, remade image bearers of God will live with him in that place, right? But it's part of this cosmic context of God remaking the world. Um, so it's not just a peripheral idea. Um, the New Testament authors, though, um, really give us a surprise. Everybody expected when Messiah comes, all this would happen all at once. And what the New Testament kind of explains to us um, is that it happens in stages. It begins with the earthly ministry of Christ. It continues in the, the life and the experience of his church. And it will co be consummated. It will be fully and finally completed when Christ comes again. And so this first and second coming of Messiah was, was a, something they weren't expecting. And so the New Testament is goes to, to links to explain this already not yet kind of dynamic of how fulfillment will happen. Does that make sense? Um, and so we, we, it's, it's common for theologians and biblical scholars to talk about how God brings his great salvation by, by bringing his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven in three stages. Right? We call them inauguration, continuation, consummation. Um, inauguration, again, just the beginning of the fulfillment of God's kingdom promises. Um, God is reshaping the world in the coming of Jesus in profound ways. Um, and so look at how John begins his gospel. Right? Very first words of John's gospel in the beginning. What comes to mind? So long ago. Okay, yeah, I didn't even get to the word yet, but just the phrase in the beginning. That's how the Bible starts, right? Those are the opening words of Genesis 1. In, in the, the Jewish Old Testament, they named their books by the first words of the book. And so what we call Genesis, they called that right? In the beginning. And so any Jew that hears John writing in the beginning, the first thing that comes to their mind is Genesis, right? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So we're starting to get this more, more fully explained doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, and we find out that this, this word that was God and was with God in some mysterious way um, is also creator, right? Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Um, yeah, what's the point, right? The point is... Jesus is the powerful, eternal word. You know, um, when, when Genesis says, and God said, let there be light, in a very kind of mysterious, glorious way, Jesus is that word that enacts creation, right? Um, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are all involved in creation. The Father intends it, and Jesus accomplishes it, right? Uh, makes it happen. Uh, he, he is that word in, 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 in that sense. And his incarnation, John is going to explain, is the beginning of God's work of recreation. Uh, this is a really beautiful idea. And then he goes on, the next two verses. Verses 4 and 5. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it, has not overcome it. If you're 
thinking from those first words in the beginning, if you're thinking Genesis 1, what kinds of connections are you making to these, to these five verses? So let there be light. Yeah. course is the original you know uh, giver of life but what John is going to start talking about in this prologue this the first 18 verses of John he's going to talk about how Jesus is the one who gives us new life he um, causes us to be born again right um, to be made the children children of God who believe believe in him so just as God in the original creation was moving against the, the chaos and the darkness um, through his powerful ordering and provision and creation, so in the coming of Jesus, God is moving against the chaos and the darkness of a fallen, cursed world and bringing light and life in the person of Christ. Um, it's really beautiful, uh, beautiful ideas. Um, comments on that before I move on. So, you know, just going through the bullets that are in your notes, his salvation restores things to what they should be. His miracles over sickness, death, the demonic realm demonstrate what the kingdom is, uh, of God is all about, right? When he brings, when he provides food in the wilderness, right? It's this picture of God providing uh, for his people in the wilderness and the promised land. He, he took the ultimate curse and unraveling of creation, Genesis 3, which we'll get to in a couple weeks, I himself through his death on the cross, and by overcoming death, by rising from the dead and walking out of the tomb, he's the source of new life um, for his people and for the creation. Um, so the inauguration of the kingdom, and the coming of Jesus in his earthly ministry, uh, is to be understood in light of the prototype that God laid down in Genesis 1, his original Creative work. Followers of Christ find in Genesis 1 when we read it and, uh, uh, not only the original creation but an anticipation of what God is doing in Christ. What he began to do in his earthly ministry and then as we'll see what he continues and will do in the future. So um, yeah, there's a reflection question here. Uh, virtually everyone recognizes there are problems in the world, and many people offer solutions to them. How does this understanding of John 1 in light of Genesis affect your appreciation for what Christ did during his birth? As you reflect on these creation themes in Jesus' ministry, what do you appreciate about that? What, what leads you to worship? What encourages you? He's making all things new, yeah. Jesus is coming to reorder everything wrong and broken and twisted and corrupted. Yeah. Well, I think in light of the question, it also points to his sovereignty. Mm -hmm. So if I'm listening to the news and I'm getting stressed out, yeah. my remembering that he is totally in control, totally sovereign, to be created and can handle it all, yeah. Yeah. not such a big deal. This, this world is broken, okay. but he's he's at work. He has a plan and a purpose that we will not uh, Mercy and love, okay, yeah. What's, what, what comes to mind when you think of that? Just like, after the fall, we deserve a curse. Yeah. But through yeah. Yeah, that yeah. Um, his path is not forever, yeah. he sends us to Jesus yeah. and never put us in curse right. permanently. Yeah, amen. In that prologue in John, it talks about the word as full of grace and truth. Okay. Yeah. Were you going to say something? Uh, actually, I'm Do we actually deserve curse? What do you think? I, I'm, I'm curious to see what people think. Right? I'm not so sure. I think we impart it upon ourselves. What do you guys think? <coughs> What's the question exactly? 
He asked if we deserve curse or if that's something that we just brought on ourselves, right? Well, it's kind of just a consequence of our rebellion. Is that what you intend by that? Yeah. I think since we're made in the image of God, that part does not deserve to be cursed, but we do have the sinful nature, uh, and we deserve not cursing, but um, correction, uh, punishment, uh, that, that. Okay. Can you, can you guys think of any scripture that would speak to the issue? Whether or not we deserve judgment, God's curse. We deserve judgment. We definitely deserve judgment. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay, so, but that could just be a consequence, you know, to, to Clark's point. The wages of sin is death. Okay, so what's suggested by the idea of wages? <clears throat> It or deserve it in, in some sense. It's what you get for what you've done. Mm -hmm. But again, to Clark's point, that could just be a natural consequence of what we've done. I don't know where that text is, but for us, in Adam walked, died, so in Christ, we right. were made alive. Right. Mark right. yeah. probably deserves judgment. <laughs> <laughs> experience that that are characteristic of new creation uh, and so God's plan to recreate the world uh, to, to continue these themes from Genesis 1 continue after Christ's coming and ascension during this time that we're in now in between his first and second coming and so when we talk about the continuation of the kingdom that's what we're talking about the growth of the kingdom between Christ's first and second comings and so um, 2 Corinthians 5.17, this is just kind of a verse in a wider context, just kind of lifted out that speaks of this. And uh, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has, has come. The old has gone, the new is here. What's Paul, what's Paul saying? Without just reading the verse again <laughs> to answer the question, how do you understand that? What's that? Restoration? Okay. Good. If anyone is in Christ, some, some translations will say, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is 
a new creation. That's not how the NIV is translating it here. I tend to think that they're correct. Um, if anyone's in Christ, a new creation has come. What's that suggesting? What's the connection between our experience of salvation and new creation? Yeah. It's just that it's done. It, it has come. It's past tense. Right? Christ is the finished work. Okay. seems to be proof of the new creation yeah. as well as being personal. Yeah, good, good. I think that's exactly right. It's evidence, right? Look, these people are in Christ. God has taken away their sins. He's given them new life. He's taken out a heart of stone. He's given them a heart of flesh. He's, he's shown his grace and mercy. He's dwelling with them. In the, you know, they're in his presence in a very real sense. If that's true, new creation has come. Right? That's evidence that new creation has come, and it's evidence that is experienced by the believer, right? We still live in a broken, fallen, corrupted world, but there's this sense in which new creation is already breaking in. The future kingdom and God and all its fulfillment has broken into the present already, ahead of time, not yet in its fullness, and that's where we get this tension between the already and the not yet. My new creation, I assume, will ever use all the Visions of the promised land that we read. Yeah. The part of yeah. yeah, there's there's senses in which um, we experience God's provision, God's blessing, God's presence. Uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, we can ask him for daily bread. If we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, we can pay for our needs. Okay? Uh, it's already not yet. There's a there's a massive tension because we're still in a fallen world, we're still sinners, but it's there's a dynamic at work with the presence of the kingdom in our lives. Um, yeah. Um, Colossians 3, 9 and 10. Um, Paul is talking about the implications of being united to Christ. And uh, some of those implications are don't lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Um, this is one of the places that we would point to to say that um, through the fall, we still bear the image of God. We still are the image of God, but it's corrupted, it's broken, it's marred. And what's happening in our sanctification is that we're being renewed in the image of God. And the knowledge, renewed in knowledge in the image of His Creator. And so there's a sense in which what is being has been corrupted by us through our sanctification is we're, we're being spiritually transformed. We're being made more and more progressively over time like Jesus, who is the image of God, right? Hebrews 1, the perfect, exact representation of his likeness. So um, this is pointing that it's an ongoing um, event. So yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Process, this right? is suggesting yeah, there's a progressive nature to it, right? We yeah. are being renewed. Yeah. Yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, one day that will be finalized. It will be glorified, right? Um, it's a relationship between sanctification, growing in our faith, becoming more like Christ over time, and glorification when that process is completed. Right? Um, yeah, so the New Testament under Moses' creation account is a standard for understanding Christ's ongoing work in our lives during this continuation stage of the kingdom. Um, consummation. So, somebody, go ahead and turn. I, I didn't put this on a slide just because it's long, but I think it's helpful to read it. Turn to Revelation 20. 21, I mean. Somebody, uh, once you're there, don't wait. Uh, read 1 through 7, and then somebody else, as soon as they're done, just jump in and read 22 through 27. Revelation 21, 1 through 7. And then 22 through 27. Who will start us off? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, 
and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I make everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are uh, victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Great, thanks. Somebody uh, pick up in verse 22. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are his temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So again, we, we've spent a lot of time studying this passage by itself, but I just wanted to read it. What are some, some ideas, terms, thoughts um, that you have in light of this picture of a new heavens and a new earth and a, a new Jerusalem? as it relates to the creation themes. So Jesus, he was present at creation. Yeah. yeah. This, uh, you know, this idea of walking with God in the cool of the garden, you know, where you have interaction with him, right? There's this, we will see him face to face kind of idea. He'll be in our midst. It's the promise of the whole Bible. Be your God, it'll be like a wild in the midst of you. This is like the ultimate expression. There's no darkness. No darkness. That's interesting. Yeah, and not even any sun. <laughs> right? Um, it's an apocalyptic vision. You know, I don't know. I, I assume there'll probably be a recreated sun, but, there, but there's a sense in which what gives us light and life, the source of, like, all the ways of the sun is a source of light, makes life possible, right? Everything is dependent for our existence on, on it, on this planet, right? <coughs> God himself will fulfill that for us. No darkness physically or spiritually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, how many of you like the beach? There's no sea. What do you think that means? That sounds tragic. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? I thought that too. That's yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you know um, that of the, the Old Testament imagery of what the sea symbolized and represented? Celebration. Not so much sin. Chaos. Chaos. You couldn't control it. It's dangerous, right? It's chaos. It's. And so there's a sense, apocalyptic vision, right? These are symbols. There's no chaos. There's no, there's no uncontrollable thing that is full of danger, right? It's harmony, it's shalom, it's peace. It's everything fitting for life. Let's uh, flip the page, maybe, maybe it's on the same page. Um, I have this one. Still well, an opportunity for a sizable lake, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we get a sense in which, you know, the, the salt water will return fresh, right? It would be life producing. Um, <laughs> the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city, this new Jerusalem. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will see him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There 
will be no more night. They will not need the lamp, light of a lamp, or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light. They will reign forever. Similar things. Again, it's apocalyptic symbolism, right? And basically, everything, uh, everything that is wrong with the world currently will be healed. Like in, in the tree of life that was in the Garden of Eden, that's not a magic tree, you know. It's it's sacramental in a sense. It's a symbol of what God does. And that tree of life is back in this picture of a new heavens and a new earth. And uh, and so, symbolically speaking, God is providing healing. Sense. There will be no more mourning or sickness or dying or death in the new heavens and new earth. But the tree of life there that symbolizes what God did to heal uh, will be present. Yeah, in, in, in this vision of, of our future. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. God, God is the one who heals the nation, right? That leaves from a tree. But, um, but that tree of life symbolizes sacramentally. Sense symbolizes what God will do. What do you think symbolically means that the loss of the seas, the loss of salt? Is there any? Well, there's a picture of um, in Ezekiel <coughs> of water coming out of the temple in Jerusalem, very similar to this. It's, it's really, I think, this passage has Ezekiel in mind, where water comes from the throne. God in the temple runs through the streets and, and winds its way to the Dead Sea and turns the Dead Sea to fresh water so that fish can live there, like super abundance, you know, crops and all these things. Whereas the salt um, was toxic. Right? We think of it as preserving or adding taste. Yeah, yeah, different metaphor. That's a that's a legitimate metaphor. When Jesus says you're the salt of the earth, he's not saying you're toxic. <laughs> <laughs> Although we are. <laughs> That's not what he's talking about, right? He's, he's getting at different aspects. So any image that we ever have, like, can have a whole range of possible ways that it can apply, a whole range of meaning, and a context is going to determine which of the characteristics of this literal picture symbolically apply in this passage, right? And in this passage, you know, the salt seas would represent chaos and, and danger and, and those kinds of things. Yeah. Well, thinking back on <clears throat> Abu's point was the healing of the nation. You know, if you have no uh, death, you don't need healing, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, and also the revelation mentioned that you know, outside the, the city of New Jerusalem, there will be different nations. And they will be coming over. Right. And uh, so implied there's still outside of the, the, with God's permanent living, his life is for the, for the saints, not Outside of the, outside the neutrals, is that is that right, or is that um, instead of the whole earth has all well, they all the whole earth enjoy God's reign, but there is still kind of like a difference between the saints. But they may be dead over there outside, as he mentioned. You know, you have a hundred year old will be like a baby. Right. right. Now, if you live forever, a hundred year old it doesn't really matter. A hundred year old, a thousand years old. So right, that means right. there is still a lifespan. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, uh, and again, given the time, I'm not going to give a full answer to this, right? But, um, you know, different prophecies are talking about specific ideas, right? And um, what, what we understand Scripture teaches as a whole is that um, at the second coming of Christ, when there's final judgment, uh, those who are separated from God uh, will be separated from God forever, right, um, in hell. And those that are in his presence will live in this new heavens and the new earth, right? And so that will encompass all of creation. And so Isaiah prophesies that the nations, the, the Gentile nations, the non-Jewish nations, will actually bring their tribute into Jerusalem uh, because they are now under the reign and rule of Israel's Messiah, right? And so 
Um, even in Revelation, when it talks about the nations bringing their goods into the city, it's this idea that they're now in, those who are rightly re reconciled to God through faith in Christ who are Gentile are, are part of God's kingdom. And they bring their tribute, like all that we have to offer, all of our cultural creations as we fulfill the cultural mandate and the new heavens and new earth for all eternity uh, will be brought to the glory of God. And I think it's, it's, it's the idea that's getting at. We need to wrap up soon. I wanna I wanna just suggest application. Um, the, the, pic, the, the big picture here is that at the end of the age under the rule of King Jesus, the perfect man, the divine creator where God will bring all things into the order and design he originally intended for the first creation. More than that, actually, it will be even more glorious than the old because the possibility of chaos will be removed. You see that in some of these imageries uh, from Revelation 21 and 22. Um, everyone, you know, Jesus alive, the world will vanquish all forms of spiritual and physical darkness. Everyone will realize there's no God but Yahweh who controls all things by a powerful word, and God's purposes for his creation will be fulfilled. So in terms of application today, I uh, just want you to reflect on this. How, uh, what do you think happens to our faith when we disconnect our eternal hope for, for, for the renewed creation and we understand our salvation only in terms of being forgiven for our sins? Does that question make sense? If one thinks of salvation as God forgives me for my sins, that's true. It's critically important. But what are we missing out if we don't understand that in the context of we get to experience the renewal of things? We would be missing out on the joy just knowing that we have a loving Savior every day praying for our life, things we do to keep us just think about, I'm forgiven. It, it can feel transactional. But when we understand we were created to walk with God, to be in His presence, a glorious creation. Right? It's almost as if forgiveness removes the barrier to what the point is. Which is relationship, life, flourishing, shalom, all things properly related in this cosmic reality of everything in its proper place woven together in a glorious fabric, right? This is not merely about me and Jesus, although it's not less than that. Right. It's more than that. It includes that. But it's me and Jesus in relationship with you and the creation and God and, and all of that together, right? It's this perfect cosmic harmony uh, of relationship and flourishing. I see this as an individual. Mm -hmm. And that's all important. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, the personal reflection question for you, um, we don't have time. I was gonna, if we had time, I was just going to let you reflect on this before you leave. But think about this. You know, what chaos are you experiencing in your life right now? What, what disruption, what brokenness, right? What are you, what, where are you tempted to run to trust other things besides God to bring harmony and peace and, and, uh, to that situation? God in that place in your life. He's the, the God who spoke and created. He's the God who's currently renewing and one day will make them so mm -hmm. reflect on where this really needs to minister to your own heart and soul right now, you know, today in your current circumstances. Let me pray for this. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this picture you give us of this beautiful Everything uh, 
flourishing, Lord, in its proper place, and, and us in relationship with you and one another and the rest of creation, Lord, uh, with no danger, no brokenness, no sin, uh, no health issues, Lord, all things made new, where you freely provide all that we need, and we get to enjoy and, and live for your glory for all eternity. Lord, encourage us with that picture. Minister to us today where we need to hear that perspective, uh, or that we would trust you and not uh, turn to false solutions of ideas.